We have now, now come to the last and seventh finalist before the break. And he is John Rebowley. He's an attorney based in Chicago. And his proposal is called a simplified blockchain approach to non-coercive decentralized global governance. Throughout history, every government that has been able to assert influence across national borders has had at least one of two things, a force projecting military or a robust economy backed by a valued currency. Militaries and currencies are enforcement mechanisms, and without an enforcement mechanism, any form of global government is simply an advisory council. Now, a global military is far beyond the scope of this endeavor and I think offensive to its core values. That leaves us with currency and economy. Blockchain technology, which is based on the idea of decentralization, offers a solution to the problems of massive, centralized, unwieldy governance and the lack of enforcement mechanisms. And it does so without resorting to military violence or other forms of coercion and without offending traditional notions of sovereignty. Before I go uh, too much further, blockchain in this context generally refers to the operating framework behind Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and related applications like the Ethereum smart contract system. Smart contracts are simply lines of code written into a blockchain application which provide for the instantaneous issuance of a currency when a specified event takes place. So with that in mind, a blockchain approach to global governance would look like this. First, using existing open source code, an application that provides for the issuance of currency and the administration of contracts would be created, something like the Ethereum platform. This can be done quickly and cheaply. Hundreds of blockchains currently exist and most were launched without significant financial backing. The uh, proposed blockchain would be initiated and endorsed by an existing well-regarded public interest organization, perhaps the foundation itself or a collective of like-minded groups in order to ensure initial exposure and to attract initial participants, including NGOs, commercial vendors, and private individuals. Next, the organizing entity announces publicly its cryptocurrency. With typical cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, currency is earned through mining, that is, uh, by users around the world lending their computers to solve complex computational problems. These administer the network and help to maintain it, and as an incentive, the users receive Bitcoin or wh whatever cryptocurrency. The currency for the proposed model would work in much the same way, but in addition to traditional mining, currency would also be earned by fulfilling smart contracts that promote globally beneficial actions. For example, a contract could be placed onto the blockchain that provides for payment to manufacturers in Kenya who meet uh, verifiable emissions targets for cooking, heating, and lighting equipment. Individuals in Stockholm or Seattle could seek to fill contracts that pay them currency if the onboard diagnostic system on their automobiles report that they are driving less than 10 miles a week or using a cleaner fuel, or if the thermostat in their home reports that they use less than 10 kilowatt hours of electricity per day. Contracts which further virtually any of the sustainable development goals or help to maintain the nine planetary boundaries can be written into the, uh, the blockchain. In this way, an idea to action marketplace is created, which through profit incentives, rather than the existing global model of uh, non-compliance penalties is created. This provides for mass interest and rapid response to pressing global issues. Government, or governance rather, um, takes the form of non-coercive guidance. Uh, anyone can place a contract on the blockchain, but the organizing entity retains the power to promote or prioritize those contracts which further its concerns. Likewise, the cryptocurrency can be used for any purpose by anyone, but it is earned by uh, fulfilling a globally beneficial purpose. And every time it is used, it ends up promoting that purpose. In uh, this way, a purpose-built economy is created with its own currency that could eventually form the basis for a universal basic income. 
this uh, proposed model doesn't ask any state to concede any sovereignty or levy additional taxes, requests that are absolute non-starters in nations with increasingly populist isolationist sentiments as seen in portions of the US, England, and elsewhere. It doesn't exclude or favor any geographic area, and it doesn't further the divide between metropolitan elites and more rural or working class populations. It is by design radically inclusive so that anybody, whether she lives in Malaysia or Madrid or Miami, can have her voice heard without reliance on political representative or some other intermediary. It's complementary to the existing UN structure and can be integrated into other forms of government or future forms of government. Uh, lastly, and most importantly, given how little time we have left to address the world's most pressing issues, it can be enacted almost instantaneously. The technology exists and the startup costs are relatively modest. All it needs to get started is an endorsement. Thank you uh, for your consideration, and I'll answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. The jury. John, thank you for that presentation. It seems like everywhere we turn, we are attacked by blockchain. So <laughs> thank I'm you for saying that. that <laughs> it's not just me. That you're, you, you're proposing this. I, I, I can see how it works in the examples that you give on a sort of project basis. I struggle to see how you would uh, leverage bro blockchain technology for conflict, um, drought migration issues. Could you speak to how that model would work? Walk us through an example. Sure, and, and actually two answers to the question. With respect to technology, I think um, that it's, it's well recognized that up to 30% of UN money that is devoted to addressing those kinds of concerns is ultimately wasted in layers of bureaucracy and administration. Blockchain by its very nature is an efficiency mechanism and we can cut out a lot of that waste. So in that sense, I think it, it really, it, it helps just, just directly in, in that way. But apart from blockchain technology, there is blockchain philosophy. And I think that's the real ingenuity in the blockchain. The technology to do Bitcoin and all these other things has existed for quite some time, about as long as the commercial internet. But the real ingenuity in blockchain is the philosophy, decentralization, elimination of intermediaries, transparency, radical inclusion, and non-coercion. I think that putting together a form of government that embraces all of those philosophical constructs goes a, lot of, a long way to reducing, for example, armed conflict. There are a lot of violent political actors in the world. I don't think any of them were likely born monsters. But I think that over time, if their voices were not heard, if the voices of their populations were not heard, if they thought that decisions that affected them were taking place in a non-transparent way, um, they become what they become, and that's on us. Yeah, I think this, I think this is a similar question here, and I want you to really talk about conflict. Um, but, uh, you know, I sense, I, I, I know that you can build this economy. You're looking at building an economy, an economy that has public value associated yep. with it. Um, but, but a lot of the risks that we're looking at are global in extent. Yep. Um, and can't be solved on a project, necessarily on a project by project basis. I, I guess the question is, is how do you aggregate this economy and scale it up in order to address uh, some of the global risks that we're looking at? Well, for example, the United States has indicated that it's going to walk away from the Paris Agreement. The United States as one entity is walking away, but as we saw in the 2016 election, the United States is more than one entity. A good chunk of the population in the United States would, I think, like to remain in that agreement. And with an economy like this, with 50% of the world's largest economy um, buying into this economy, or, or a significantly high number, then the United States really hasn't walked away from the Paris Agreement. Part of it has, but a big chunk of it's still there, and that's a step in the right direction, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.